didn't know I was getting recorded. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, two things, a thank you and an apology. Uh, a thank you to the Pocketcube Symposium, to Arbor Orbital, Arbor Orbital for the invitation and for welcoming me here and Gilberto here to this wonderful uh, venue. And an apology because this is my first day at the conference, so I've missed many of your presentations and it's not my fault. Uh, it was uh, Amsterdam Schiphol Airport's fault for not being able to cope with less than three millimeters of snow. Um, but okay, I will look at the presentations, they're being recorded and I'll, I'll look back. So, uh, my name is Alexander Kinnaird. I work for the European Space Agency in the Education Office. Uh, I'm going to be presenting this presentation on our program, Fly Your Satellite, uh, for around 10 minutes, and then I'm going to hand over to Gilberto, who's also going to talk about the inclusion of pocket cubes in this program. Oh. I have to point at a laptop, it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, as I said, so I'm going to start the presentation, give you an overview of what is the European Space Agency Education Office, in particular the ESA Academy. Uh, maybe you've heard those two things, and I'm going to explain a little bit about what the difference is. Uh, talk about the Flyer Satellite Program, of which I'm the program coordinator, and then hand over to Gilberto to talk about Pocket Cubes. The inclusion in our program, why we're doing it, the challenges that we see, and the first steps we're making towards a Flyer Satellite Pocket Cube specification or standard. So what is the ESA Education Office and why do we do education in ESA? So most of you, I suspect, you know about the European Space Agency, uh, where an agency of a number of member states of Europe all cooperating together to achieve a peaceful exploration of space. Um, we have this education office where I work and our kind of purpose is to inspire and enable young people to consider careers and further research in space. Uh, we do this by giving inspiration, uh, but also by giving, by giving skills and training and access to space through hands-on opportunities. This is what our overall program offer looks like. So the office is roughly split in half. Um, we have half of the office which is dealing with young students. So this is students from the age of 5 to 18, high schools and primary schools. Uh, and here we're mainly focusing on giving access to or inspiring students about space through activities in their schools. Uh, so it's a lot about classroom resources, about teacher training, about online activities. I'm not going to talk about that anymore. If you want to know more about those things, come find me or Gilberto after this, after this talk, and we can talk to you about this. On the other half, we have the ESA Academy. Uh, this is the part of the office which deals with education for university students and young professionals. Basically, everyone from 18, no upper age limit. Uh, and I have another slide on this that gives a bit more detail, so don't worry too much about this slide. Yeah, just to say that our opportunities are available for students from all ESA member states and a number of cooperating states. You can see the states up there on the slide. Um, and one of our key tenants is that we're about the transfer of expertise from ESA professionals to those young professionals and young, and young students as well. So it's not just me and Gilberto giving the training. It's not just me and Gilberto and our colleagues involved in the tests and, and the opportunities. It's all about the ESA experts who are doing this in their day-to-day -day work on the big satellites, being able to transfer this opportunity or their expertise to the younger students. So here, I don't know if you can see too well, but here is the breakdown of the ESA Academy and our full program offer as of now. So the Academy is essentially broken down into three pillars of, oh, oh yeah, what happened? Sorry. Okay, there we go. So the Academy is broken down into three pillars of uh, training, projects, and engagement. I've highlighted the two parts here which are probably the most interesting for you, those working with satellites. Uh, so we have a training element and particularly a satellites element here within projects. As per the STEM or the young people uh, section of the previous slide, if you want to know about any of these other aspects, so experiments on many different platforms, our rocketry programs, or all the engagement elements, just come ask me uh, or Gilberto at any point during the conference. Because I'm going to talk about satellites and training. Uh, yeah, so within the satellites element, we have the Fly Your Satellite program. Uh, this is the program we are using to support universities uh, and tertiary education institutes with the development of their own satellites. To date, this means CubeSats, uh, but I'll explain on another slide that we're now expanding the, the portfolio as well. There's three ways that student teams can participate in this program. We have a full Fly Your Satellite program where teams can join us around, yeah, post CDR, so they should have something of a consolidated design and they should be almost ready to integrate their satellite. And then we have two other streams. We have a design booster stream and a test opportunity stream. Design booster is for universities or, or project teams with a little bit more, a little bit less experience in immature design and they need help consolidating that design with our ESA experts. And this is a fixed duration program of one and a half years, which is bookended by two reviews. 
And then we have a test opportunities program, which is almost the other end of the project life cycle, which is for student teams who need access to test facilities, so environmental test facilities, and they're supported for between <coughs> five and six months with designing, executing, and understanding an environmental test. Then we also have a portfolio of training opportunities. So here individual students can apply to participate in a training week or summer school at our training facility in Belgium. Uh, and here we have training courses related to satellites such as the CubeSat Concurrent Engineering Workshop, CubeSat Summer School, Spacecraft Testing Workshop, CubeSat Hands-On Training, but also many other courses which are more generic, so not just related to satellites, but things like space law, uh, earth observation, and that kind of thing. You can see on the last slide we have a, a link to where all you can find all this information. Uh, just to give you a bit of background, we have done satellites in the ESA Education Office for quite a few years. We did our first launch in 2012, so this was actually the first ESA involvement with CubeSats. Um, so ESA Education tends to be the one that picks up these new form factors, or these new, uh, new ways of accessing space. Uh, and we've supported over 38 student teams over the past uh, 12, 13 years or so. And I'm very happy to say actually we had the most recent launch just last Friday, uh, which was ISAT-1, uh, which is now the first satellite for the Republic of Ireland in orbit and operating as of, of uh, yeah, Friday. So what do the teams get that are participating in our program? Uh, as I said, one of the key things is you're getting direct support from the ESA experts. Uh, we're also imposing or trying to impose on the teams the importance of verification and good documentation, something that doesn't necessarily happen naturally within the university environment. Uh, Students get to participate in workshops, training courses, uh, access to environmental test facilities. They are encouraged to use ESA standards and best practices. We have some guidelines and some tailored standards that we can make available or applicable to your projects. Uh, and they receive, crucially, financial sponsorship for participation in all of these parts. So students get, get their flights paid, their accommodation paid, their food paid when they're traveling to any workshops, traveling to any test campaigns, traveling to any launch campaigns. Uh, and for the teams that are participating in the full project cycle, we also pay for the launch opportunity. Uh, what I should say is that we don't pay for the hardware and we don't pay for any facilities inside the university. So that is funding that you need to get from your own university. I mentioned about our test facility. So we have a dedicated test facility, the CubeSat support facility, which is in Essex Galaxia, which is ESA's education site in Belgium, near Redu. Uh, and here we have available this nice clean room uh, with test facilities. The big, two big test items are the shaker and the thermal vacuum chamber, and these are often things that you can't have access to or don't have access to in your university or even in your own country. Uh, and we can make those available to teams participating in the program as well. Gilberto spends a lot of his time working in there, so if you have questions, technical questions about this, you can also ask him. Now, we've opened the call for applications for Flyer Satellite 4, so the fourth edition of Flyer Satellite. For the first time, we're expanding the, part, the, uh, the eligible form factors for this program. So we traditionally have supported one, two, and three unit CubeSats. And now we're asking also for applications for one, two, and three P pocket cubes. Uh, we're also expanding the program a little bit to focus more on downstream applications and other elements such as entrepreneurship. And Gilberto is going to explain a little bit about why this is. Uh, yeah, deadline for proposals is the 21st of January. And we're looking for teams who are nearly ready to integrate. So for the CubeSat world, we know what this means pretty well. We know that they have a consolidated design, uh, and they've done some subsystem testing, and they're pretty much ready to integrate within six months. For the Pocket Cube world, we also have to learn with you what ready to integrate really means in terms of timelines. So that's also some questions I'm going to be asking around in the room. This is what the timeline proposed to look like. So we have the uh, call for proposals already open. Uh, the eligible teams that are selected uh, will be taken to a training week, and then they'll go through a project review, and after which we hope they will shortly be ready to integrate their flight model to go into functional testing, and then environmental testing, a flight acceptance review, and a launch. And you can see the time scale there. We're looking between, yeah, it's probably two to three years for the first launch, and this might stretch for a more complicated and more complex projects. Then I will hand over to Gilberto. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. <clears throat> so uh, very nice to be here. Uh, of course, uh, I've chatted with a lot of you already. So uh, my name is Gilberto. I work with Alex on the Flyer Satellite Program. Um, so why pocket cubes? Um, for a lot of reasons, in fact. Um, uh, it, it, so the Flyer Satellite Program is changing. Why is it changing? Because ESA Education has a new uh, initiative that was branded uh, uh, Space for Education 2030. 
What, the, what does this mean is that uh, the, all the ease education programs are adapting, including new, uh, new objectives with the idea of addressing the uh, current socio-economical changes that are happening uh, right now. So how does this bring up us to pocket cubes? Well, we believe that with pocket cubes we can address a lot of new uh, disciplines, uh, such as uh, something non-traditional, such as uh, climate, resources, uh, or cybersecurity, uh, all these kind of things. And as well, the <coughs> also the, the idea is, uh, besides addressing new, uh, new topics, we also want to attract new audiences. Um, we're talking about uh, 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 students from uh, non-traditional. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. No. This work. Yeah. <laughs> Mic check. This one's. It worked for you. Okay. Yeah. Maybe a little bit closer. <laughs> maybe closer to here. Yeah. Uh, so we want to attract uh, new audiences that are not traditionally doing space, such as uh, farmers, architects, or uh, businessmen, entrepreneurships. So uh, we want to, to diversify a bit. Diversification is a little bit the key word that I like. Uh, another another, well, another uh, goal of including pocket cubes is to... <laughs> is to, uh, to reduce a bit uh, the entry barrier. So um, doing CubeSat is already quite an effort for universities. We believe that by uh, including pocket cubes, this with, in this way we will be able to reduce the, the effort that is uh, necessary for a university to develop a satellite and as such attract maybe new universities that don't have the heritage, don't have the expertise yet, and also bring them to do sp uh, space and to develop satellites to uh, uh, and uh, and yeah develop new new expertise we also hope to reduce the the development life cycle i mean everybody agrees i believe in this room that developing pocket cubes uh, is going to be uh, is faster than developing a cube set so that's also uh, what we hope to do to uh, uh, increase the the throughput of the program by having uh, higher edu educational return in this way. So, um, including pocket cubes in the program is not uh, immediate. In fact, there are a few challenges that we have identified and we're trying to address. Um, first of all, well, uh, most obvious probably technical scopes. Uh, if you compare a pocket cube to a CubeSat, obviously the onboard resources are much more limited. Uh, the, the, the spacecraft, the, the bus, the pocket cube bus allows you to do less things. So as such, you need to, uh, the, 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 let's say, the availability of resources on board is a limiting factor, so we have to, to think that way. Um, but I don't think this is a limitation per se, more like a, an opportunity to expand and, and, and focus on, uh, on different things. In fact, what we are trying to do is to shift a little bit the focus from technology, maybe, and maybe it's an opportunity to switch to, to new, new topics. As I mentioned earlier, uh, agriculture or uh, outreach, uh, these kind of things. Um, launchers, uh, obviously the launch market is less attractive uh, than uh, for, for pocket cubes uh, than for CubeSats. The, um, the launch market is running a lot, has a lot of opportunity for CubeSats, but uh, pocket cubes, uh, maybe some launch, launch authorities, they, they're not prepared to do that, so that's one of the, the, the challenges. Um, as Alex mentioned earlier, it's not just us working at the, on the Flare Satellite Program, but we have a lot of specialists, technical specialists that work at ESA that helps us. And uh, how they do their work is basically by reviewing the projects and providing their knowledge, their technical expertise. So their, the traditional ESA approach is to remove a lot of risk, uh, while pocket cubes instead, uh, maybe we, sh we are shifting towards a, a higher risk tolerance. So that is something that we need to, uh, to address. And uh, 
yeah, we basically uh, we need to adapt uh, a little bit our approach. Uh, systems engineering, well, everyone that works at ESA, we are all systems engineer. I myself am a systems engineer, also Alex uh, maybe considers himself a systems engineer. Uh, the systems engineer notion in pocket cubes is different. So uh, even with, with cubes, that's traditional, the approach is, uh, is a, maybe the notion of systems engineering with pocket cubes is a bit of a stretch. Now uh, with, with pocket cubes is even more of a, a new ground. Um, timeline. <coughs> uh, so obviously, if you participate to fly a satellite, this is going to require a lot of effort. Uh, as to work with us, it's, uh, there's going to be a, a, a lot of documents that needs to be produced. So we have to find a way to, to work together to make the program efficient and have, uh, don't slow you down too much, let's say. And finally, but one of the most important challenges, space debris mitigation. Uh, Shevket yesterday has mentioned already, there is a new, uh, obviously new, um, uh, new challenges that are coming along. We have a new uh, ESA space debris mitigation policy that is imposing strict stricter, um, uh, stricter requirements. And as such, we need to, to address that with pocket cubes in a way that maybe is not straightforward. So how do we do that? Um, the first step we have adopted to, um, uh, to, uh, to address pocket cubes with Flyo satellite is to, by developing a new, uh, a new technical requirement specification. You may ask why to include a, a, a new requirement specification when there is already the pocket cube standards. Well, um, pocket cube standards, as we all know, is basically a mechanical interface control uh, document. What we wanted to address instead is a lot of additional requirements that we traditionally uh, that we uh, that we give to our students when they participate to fly a satellite to develop a, a, um, a satellite. And we're talking about requirements such as electrical requirements, operational requirements, or test requirements, which are not uh, included in the original pocket cube standard. So we are trying, we have made an effort to fill this gap by um, releasing this new design specification. Um, this I will skip because I'm taking too much time. So how, what's in the new design specification? Uh, um, well, we have the, the mechanical interface requirements. These are inherited, in fact, from the pocket cube standard as it is, so we're not changing anything over there. The, cube, the pocket cube still looks the same. But we are adding all these kind of things. Um, legal, regulatory need. This is a requirement that we want to we, we impose, so we require our students to uh, register the satellite with their national governments. We want the students to coordinate the frequency, and uh, a lot of other things, uh, quality assurance uh, targets. This is something that we, uh, we adopt as a, also an educational goal to improve the quality of the project. And verification and validation target, we're talking about testing here. So uh, um, we have included vibration testing requirement, uh, thermal vacuum testing requirements. Uh, things like this. So all, how this was done is a lot of building on uh, lessons learned and our experience uh, with the CubeSats. So we directly transposed a lot of things and the space debris mitigation uh, requirements, we are directly applying the new ESA space debris mitigation policy. In fact, don't be, if you're planning to apply the Flyer satellite with a pocket cube project, don't be scared. The, I know the, the space debris mitigation policy as it is, is a very, has a lot of uh, complexity in it, but we will work together with you. We will provide training to those um, students that participate to the project to, uh, to address the, the issue together. So you're not going to be left alone with that. Uh, we're going to help you. Uh, this I will skip. Uh, just a brief focus on the space debris mitigation requirements. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, what we're aiming at 
in, in a nutshell, it, this is the, 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 the key point, the five years from injection. So uh, we're, the, all the pocket tube missions that we work with, we're going to aim at deorbiting them within five years from injection, from launch. Uh, and another key point is the in orbit breakup risk prob probability, which we want it to be less than 10 to the minus 3. How does this translate, translate into practice? Is by limiting the, the breakup risks by, for example, the batteries they need to have protections. That's all. Um, if you have questions, of course, you can, you're free to approach us. Uh, we're going to stick around for the, for the day. And uh, you can check this link for the current opportunities uh, are open for the Ease Education program and our social medias. So thanks very much. Questions? Who's got questions? No one has questions for Isa? Oh, here we go. Wolfpack. Thank you for sharing. Do you have any, uh, are there any opportunities for collaboration with organizations outside uh, Isa, like in the States, especially with education institutions or companies, not necessarily NASA? Um, it's complicated. <laughs> So, uh, you know the European Space Agency is a publicly funded organization uh, and we have to somehow ensure those public funds uh, are re-returned to their member states, but it's not a hard no. Um, and I'm not asking about like a transfer of money, I'm saying just collaboration. Collaborate, exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would have to be without an exchange fund. I mean, collaborations are, are always possible, but we, we'd have to see what the, the framework looked like. Um, something like a collaboration between a European educational institute and an American educational institute, I could see, I could see being possible. Um, yeah, okay. It also comes with challenges, but uh, yeah, it, 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 it's always a possibility. We can chat after. Yeah. Over here. Know, high school or university, it might be easier to go into the, the program. From a US standpoint, it, it's possibly easier than to collaborate with a French or British uh, university. So uh, the point was that uh, Canada is a collaborating state. So you saw on the flags, uh, we have some member states which you might not consider particularly European, like Canada. Uh, and hopefully the example of ESA getting involved, you know, a serious space agency doing serious stuff, this will hopefully help uh, potentially convince folks over at NASA and uh, the sort of complementary programs in the US that this is something they should pursue. And, and we've already found that the fact that ESA is willing to take a, a, a bet on the pocket standard and, and get behind teams that, that could potentially change the sort of uh, attitudes and other teams that are seeing uh, ESA get involved in, in our jurisdictions. And obviously NASA would be one of those guys. So. Oh, Jacks, okay, that's great. Yeah, we'd love to. I mean, more the better, right? So, um, got time for one more question for the ESA guys. Does anybody, you know, they're funding Polcubes? Like, you guys want to chat to them? Like, come on. <laughs> Who's got questions? Oh, at the back. Just show us. Oh, got, well, I'll make for you. There seems to be some resistance to systems engineering in the program. But it isn't, isn't, aren't pocket cubes, aren't pocket cubes the perfect place to introduce systems engineering to st for students? Because it'd be one of the first times that you're trying to integrate a lot of different systems together and they all have to work in a low swap environment. So I would have hoped that you'll get a lot of traction from your push to introduce systems engineering. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Yeah, it's a perfect opportunity to introduce these kind of notions, of course. For us, is a challenge because the way we usually work with students is by adopting a systems engineering approach. And the fact, the complexity of a CubeSat project, which is higher than a pocket cube, is already a sort of obliging the students to adopt systems engineering practice. In pocket cubes, I see that there's a little bit less of a push in that direction, but of course, 
definitely it's a perfect opportunity to introduce these notions. Yes, we, are, we agree on that. Awesome. Big round of applause for the guys from ESA.